I'll pass these around. These are both the same. But about 15 years ago, I have a friend who is a, a retired Vallejo police officer, and we were able to arrange to actually go out to the court. So we were actually we actually were able to go on board, which of course really is not safe and not advisable. But but just so you can see what it looks like from actually on the deck. Now remember, this is 15 years ago. So I'll just pass that. Just just pass it around. To you right there. Now, at the time we went out there, we were able to drive out almost to the ship and then park and then walk the rest of the way. But that's not possible now. So maybe somebody can fill me in on this. Is it possible that they remove the levee to restore the wetlands over here? Yes. That, that is true? That's yeah. Leon's fault. Okay. <laughs> Right, because, because when I looked over there last time I was out here, I thought, well, there's no way we could have driven out there. There must have been a levee there that was, has since been removed. So, so I think the only way to get close right up to the ship now is to, uh, is to take a boat. So let me tell you, uh, like I said, more than you ever want to know about World War One destroyer. So this is a... World War I? Um, uh, what is known as a flush deck... Destroyer, also known as a four stacker or a four piper. Four stacker because it had four smokestacks. It's called a flush deck destroyer because it had one single upper deck. Rather than a raised focusal or a raised forward deck, everything was down on one deck. Now that doesn't mean it was a completely flat deck. Of course, it had the smokestacks, it had various vents, gun mounts, things like that. But it was all on one, all on one level. So that's why it's known as a flush deck or flush deck. Um, so these ships were built, there were actually three classes of these ships. Uh, the, the Caldwell class, the Wicks class, and the Clemson class. And they were built between 1917 and 1922. So uh, there were actually of these flush deck destroyers, there were 273 of them built. So there were a lot of these built. And they were built at shipyards all over the United States. So 15 of them were built at Mare Island. The quarry was not built at Mare Island, but 15 of them were built at Mare Island, uh, including the USS Caldwell, which is the lead ship in, in one of the three classes. Uh, the, the class of vessels is always named after the first ship in that, uh, that was built in that class. And there, they really were not a great deal of difference in the three classes. Uh, there's just subtle difference in maybe the armament and uh, possibly the length slightly and, and maybe the boilers and the propulsion system. So there's not a lot of differences, but there were three different classes of these ships. They were, um, they were authorized by the Naval Act of 1916. So 1916, <coughs> World War I was already underway in Europe, but the United States was not yet into it. But it was on the horizon, so the Navy was building up, and Congress authorized the construction of these, these new types of destroyers. And the purpose of these destroyers primarily was as an escort vessel, either for um, uh, private or commercial convoys, uh, uh, you know, ferrying war supplies, or even for military convoys. But they also served as uh, anti-submarine uh, warfare ships. Uh, during World War One, of course, there was a lot of U-boat action in the Atlantic, and these were the ships because they were small and fast that could track the U-boats and engage in anti-submarine warfare. So that's what these ships were built for. But they served all kinds of different purposes uh, because there were so many of them. To give you an idea of what this ship, uh, the length of this ship, the, the specifications of of this type of ship when they were built, uh, would have been 314 feet long. So essentially the length of a football field, if you're a visual thinker. Uh, the beam is about 31, 32, 31 and a half feet, so pretty narrow. Uh, they had a draft of 9 feet, so not very deep in the water. And they can make 35 knots, which is pretty good speed. Pretty good speed, 35 knots. Uh, they had a range of uh, 4,900 miles, so you had a pretty good range and made pretty good speed. But it's a small ship. They only had a... Uh, complement officers and crew of 122 men. So some of you who are in the Navy understand that that's a pretty small vessel. Uh, the, the armaments that they had were four four-inch guns, one three-inch gun, but they were also equipped with 12 21-inch torpedo tubes. So that was really their, their main uh, fighting strength. So the quarry over here, 
was launched on March 28, 1921, so almost 98 years ago. Uh, next month will be 98 years since that ship was launched. Uh, uh, Union Iron Works in San Francisco. Uh, the ship was commissioned two months later in May of 1921. And the USS Corry, C-O-R-R-Y, was named after a naval aviator and a Medal of Honor winner uh, by the name of William M. Corry, Jr. Um, in the early days of naval aviation, when there were very few pilots in the Navy, this is pre-World War I, uh, every aviator who qualified was assigned a number. And William Corey was the Navy's aviator number 23. So he's pretty early in the whole process of naval aviation. Uh, Corey served in Europe during World War I. Uh, he commanded a squadron there. Uh, he was in France. He uh, uh, was very well uh, respected and well decorated for his service during World War I. Later on, um, near the end of the war or just after the war, he was back stateside and he was a passenger in a plane that crashed. And Corey was thrown free of the of the crash and survived, but he ran back to the plane to try to get the pilot out. And in doing so, he was badly burned and later died and was awarded the Medal of Honor as a result of that heroic action. And so um, that's why the ship was named in his honor, because of his service in the military and because of his uh, the fact that he won the Medal of Honor. Uh, as far as I can tell, he did not save the pilot. So that's that's the unfortunate part. But, you know, he did make the throw again. So, um, of the three different classes that I mentioned, this is one of the Clemson-class destroyers. Uh, they, they were built at seven different Navy yards, or private shipyards, including Bear Island. Uh, so the Clemson class were built at seven different yards, but altogether there were 11 different shipyards that built these flush deck destroyers. Uh, they were, uh, the, the other ones were of different classes. Um, so they served during World War I, uh, but most of them, uh, like the Cory, was authorized during World War I, and the majority of them weren't completed until the war was over. So suddenly you've got 273 of these very fast, efficient ships that were quickly built, but the war is over and there's not a lot of need for them anymore. So following World War I, there was also a series of peace treaties and disarmament treaties. And so as a result, uh, more than half of the 273 flush deckers were placed in reserve after the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922. This is when the different sides in the conflict agreed to disarm and to scale back. So already within a year of when the quarry was launched, most of these ships were already being taken out of service. They weren't technically decommissioned, but they were just placed in reserve. Um, so a little bit about the history of the quarry. She was launched in 21. In October of 1922, the USS Corey and the USS Hull uh, spent about a month surveying the ocean floor up and down the California coast from San Francisco Bay down to the Channel Islands and back and using new um, depth locator technology that they were able to get more accurate charts of the ocean floor off the coast of California. Um, later on, she went down to the Panama Canal and performed the same function at both ends of the Panama Canal, charting the undersea um, lay of the land, so to speak, at both ends of the canal uh, to determine you know, na any navigation hazards, things like that. Uh, later on in 1923, Corey accompanied uh, a ship called the USS Henderson, which took President Warren Harding on a cruise uh, up to Canadian waters and up to Alaska. Uh, Harding was making this uh, cross-country goodwill trip, but he's also getting ready for the upcoming presidential campaign in 1922. So the same thing they did in they were doing that. He was barnstorming around the country. But he took this ship um, from Seattle up to Alaskan waters, and the quarry accompanied that ship. And so there's, of course, no evidence that President Harding was ever actually aboard the, the quarry, but the, but they were part of the same group that went up to Alaska. Now, unfortunately, when Harding came back from Alaska, he was already in pretty good, pretty bad shape physically. Uh, and he took ill 
And on the train trip from Seattle down to San Francisco, he became even more ill. And when he arrived in San Francisco, within a few days, he died. Uh, President Harding died in San Francisco just after this trip to Alaska, which Corey, uh, Corey participated in. Um, so, so that's it. I mean, that's really pretty much the extent of the service of this ship. There was no warfare. Uh, she did serve valuable purpose of doing these underwater charting. But in um, 1930, even more of these ships were decommissioned as a result of the London Naval Treaty. So more of them were being taken out of commission. But again, there were 273 ships total, so uh, there's still quite, quite a number of them. Um, now, at that same time, 50 of these Clemson class destroyers were equipped with what they called Yarrow, Y-A-R-R-O-W, Yarrow boilers, the propulsion system. And that is named for the company that manufactured them in England and the designer of these boilers. But they were very inefficient, and they were at the point, um, in 1930, most of these ships were less than 10 years old, the boilers are already failing. But at this point, of course, they're scaling back the size of the fleet they don't need as many ships, so rather than spend the money to put new boilers in these ships and to refurbish them, they decided to scrap them all. And so I suspect that the quarry was one of the 30 or the 50 ships that was equipped with these Yarrow boilers, and that's why she was selected to be scrapped. Um, so altogether, actually, I think 56 of them were scrapped because they had these obsolete boilers rather than rather than repair them, they were just scrapped. Um, to go back to just a little bit more history on, and actually as we go down the trail, we'll get even a little bit closer, uh, but you can also look with binoculars to get a, a better idea. Uh, just to, to talk a little bit more about these destroyers in general. In 1923, there was a squadron of 14 of these uh, traveling off the California coast down near Point Honda in the fogs and uh, the lead vessel, through a series of navigational errors, steamed full blast right into the coast, right into the coast. And six more followed. So seven, until they finally realized what was going on and sent out the word, you know, everybody went stop. Seven of these, seven of these destroyers wrecked on the rocks down near Point Honda, and you can still see the wreckage of some of them down there. This was the biggest peacetime disaster in the U.S. Navy's history. Uh, through this miscalculation, seven of these were wrecked on the rocks down there. Later on, as it got closer to World War II, uh, 19 of these Clemson-class destroyers were transferred to Great Britain in 1940 as part of what they called the Destroyers for Bases program. The, U the U.S. was not in World War I yet, but Britain, of course, was. And Britain very badly needed more ships. Uh, and so, because we were still technically neutral, we couldn't sell them these ships, but we were able to trade them. So what the U.S. and Britain agreed upon was that Great Britain would provide the U.S. with long-term leases to construct Navy bases in various parts of the world that were under the control of Great Britain. And in return, we would give them these 19, well, 19 of the Clemson class and then several more of other classes. And so to this day, we still have U.S. Navy bases in different parts of the world that were established as part of this Destroyers for Bases program. So some of them went to Great Britain. Others were converted to uh, mine layers and seaplane tenders and other types of utility vessels. Um, in the early days of World War II, again, still before the U.S. was officially involved after December 7th, uh, the USS Reuben James, one of these ships, was sunk by the Germans in the Atlantic. Uh, we were still technically a neutral power, but that sort of escalated the, uh, the tensions there between the Axis powers and, and the Allies in the United States. Another one of these ships, not this class, it was of the Wicks class, but a force stacker, um, that was built at Mare Island was the USS Ward. The USS Ward was one of the more famous ships in Mare Island history for a couple of different reasons. The USS Ward was built in 1917, and at the time that she was started, um, the shipyard workers at Mare Island decided that they wanted to prove that Mare Island workers were the fastest and the most efficient and the most patriotic of any shipyard in the United States. So they set a goal to build the USS Ward, ship very much like this one, in 30 days. 
you'll see photographs of a big banner, 30 days or bust. They were going to build this ship in only 30 days. And no one thought they could do it because no one had ever built a ship in only 30 days before. Even a ship as small as this takes quite, quite a lot of work to, to from the keel laying to the launching. But they said, we're going to do this in 30 days. We can prove that we can do this. They actually built and launched the USS Ford in 17 and a half days, actually setting a world record at that time for any ship built by the Navy. Later on, the USS Ward was at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. And a little over, a little more than an hour before the Japanese attack, around 6 a.m. Hawaiian time, the USS Ward was outside the harbor and they spotted a miniature Japanese submarine. Uh, these were small submarines that carried just a couple of torpedoes and they had a crew of, I think, only two men. And it was, in essence, kind of a suicide vessel. They, the idea was to go in close to the ship, fire the torpedoes, and then turn around and get out. Well, most of the time they didn't turn around and get out. Uh, but the, the USS Ward fired on this Japanese submarine, again, an hour before the, the attack by the planes, and they fired on this little submarine and sank it. So the USS Ward, one of these destroyers that was built to Mare Island, actually fired the first American shots of World War II at Pearl Harbor. And just a few years ago, uh, the Navy was actually able to locate the, the hull of that submarine, that little Japanese submarine, right around the area where the ward claimed to have sunk and, and verified that, in fact, the, the submarine was sunk. And so, um, so these, these vessels saw a lot of different duty, and some of them very kind of uh, mundane uh, careers, didn't do much of anything, some of them very, very glorious careers. Uh, such as the USS Ward. And the Ward, by the way, was, was later lost during World War II. So at the outbreak of World War II, there were still 120 of these flush deckers still in service, uh, roughly 20 years after they were built and launched. Of those that went into service during World War II, one out of four was lost in the war. However, they were also very highly decorated for their service during World War II. So they they were right in the thick of the action. Many of them were lost, but they were also very uh, well recognized for their valor during the war. Um, after the war, um, most of these were um, were decommissioned. The last of these flush deck destroyers were decommissioned in 1947. Some of them, which had been transferred to the Royal Navy, as I mentioned, were later loaned to Russia and at least one of them was in service as late as 1952. And then several others were sold to private owners and were used for commercial purposes. And one of them was in use in commercial trade as recently as 1950 and wasn't scrapped until 1955. So some of these survived as recently as, at least one as recently as 1955. So um, I told you a little bit about the history of those destroyers in general and about the history of the USS Corey. But why is she up here? That's, that's the, really the question that you're all here to find out, right? So, as I mentioned, these, these uh, vessels with the faulty boilers were decommissioned. A lot of them were decommissioned at Mare Island, and they began to scrap them. Um, and that was the Corey. At some point, this is in 1930, at some point, uh, the Navy decided that they weren't going to scrap these vessels. They were going to sell them to private contractors and let them scrap them. So the quarry was sold, partially dismantled, to a ship called the Rosenthal Junk Company of Oakland. That's basically a scrap metal company. She was towed down to Oakland. And actually, there was all sorts of scrap metal at that time in Mare Island. So according to the story I read, she was piled full of scrap metal. And the, and the company, the Rosenthal Company, said, we'll buy the whole, the whole stuff. We'll buy the whole thing. And they took it down to Oakland, where they scrapped a little bit more. And then, next thing we know, she's up here. And that is the mystery. How did the ship that was sold to a private contractor and taken to Oakland to be scrapped, how did she end up up here? And that has always been a mystery. Some people said it was a floating restaurant. Some people said the company, because 1930 is the beginning of the Great Depression, the company's having many financial problems and they just needed to get rid of this ship. Some people said it was brought up here to be a part of the breakwater. But no one really knows for sure, and it really wasn't reported in the local papers. And so that is the great mystery. And I should mention also that the quarry, a lot of us say the quarry is the last known of these 273 flush deck destroyers. 
But there is another one in the Bay Area. Down in the South Bay, there is a former USS Thompson, um, all the way down by the San Mateo Bridge. And she was sunk and is completely below the surface of the water and was also used for target bombing practice during World War II. And so what, what is left of the USS Thompson still appears on navigational charts uh, and is marked as a navigational hazard, but isn't visible above the waterline at all. And sometimes, depending on the tides, uh, like a Google Maps image, you'll be able to see the outline. But it is not nearly as intact as the USS uh, Quarry here. The other thing is that you can see, especially if you use binoculars, there's a big chunk cut out of the side. And basalt rock up here in Napa cut several pieces of the hull out during World War II because they needed that plate metal to use in other construction projects. So that's how that took place. So some of you may have seen the article in the Napa Register a few days ago about this talk and about the quarry. So this is... This, to me, is the best part of the whole day. I hope, I hope you'll find it interesting, too. <laughs> so I got a phone call yesterday at work. And um, and actually, my secretary gave me this message. and said, this, this guy, Mr. Clark, called. And he says he knows something about the quarry. And I'm really busy. And I thought, oh, well, I, you know, I, I, all right, I'll call him back. You know, I almost didn't call him back. Well, I'm glad I did, because Hi. this was uh, Bill Clark okay. of Napa. He's 95 years old, and he is nephew and the last surviving family member of a family that he said were the Clark brothers. And the Clark brothers ranched and farmed all of this land. And he said, I know all about the quarry because I'm 95 years old and I was there. As a, as a boy, he said his father and uncles arranged to have the quarry brought up here from Oakland and uh, they cut holes in the hull, and they pushed her ashore with a couple of tugboats, specifically to shore up the levee. So that is the true story, and this is from someone who was actually there. He, he said he didn't see it actually happen, but as a little kid, he knew it happened. It happened, and as a kid, he climbed all over that ship. He fished there. He he ranged all over this property, and so. That's someone who was actually here. Finally, after all these years, because I got this phone call yesterday, <laughs> but I almost didn't return. You made that call back. I made that call back. <laughs> all of you remember, you know, make this call back. So, so, but here, here's one other interesting twist to it. The Clark brothers didn't own this land, he told me. They leased this land, as well as other properties around the area. They leased this land from the property owner, who was a police officer in Oakland. So the Rosenthal Company was also based in Oakland. So that's the next step, is, is there a connection there? Maybe the, the cop that owned all of this land had a family member that worked, worked for the Rosenthal Company. Or maybe they drank beer together in the bar and they got to talk. I'm thinking that that has got to be the connection between this Oakland police officer that owned all of this land and the company that bought the ship and took it to Oakland to be scrapped. And maybe that's how it ended up here. So we've got to do a little bit more research because the Clark brothers would not be listed on title records as the owners of the land, but the property owner would be. So we can maybe trace the title back to the 1930s, find out the name of the property owner, and then do more research on the Rosenthal Company and try to figure out whether that's how the ship ended up here. But at least we know from someone who was actually here that that's why the ship was brought here in 1930, 31, to be sunk to shore up the levee there. And that's it. That's, that's why the ship is here. So, so now you know more than you ever wanted to know about World War <laughs> So as we walk down, continue down, there are a couple areas where we'll be a little bit even closer. You'll be able to see it a little bit better. Uh, those of you who brought binoculars, and I have a pair here, uh, maybe you want to share them so people can get a little bit closer look. Um, and then maybe as we loop around the back and down the back side of the trail, we'll, we'll take you know one other one or two other stops and uh, maybe tell you a little bit more about Mare Island's history if you're interested, and, and then we'll, we'll head on back. Did you, yes. did you see what shipyard built the quarry? Uh, the Union Ironworks in San Francisco. Uh -huh.